Okay, here we are again. This is Paul Roebuck. Uh, I'm coming back with our part two of our six part webinar for you. And we're again addressing red flags, property inspections. Uh, so you'll see that as we go through there, I'll show you a lot of pictures. We'll discuss some things. Some of our presentation will be a little longer than others. Some of them won't be quite so long, but you can listen to these at your own convenience because we are pre-recording these. So here we go. Let's get going right on into it. If you have questions or comments, you can email them to paul at internachi.org, and I'll reply to you just as soon as, as possible. Try to answer your question. I'm here to help. So let me know if I can help you, and I'll be more than happy to uh, assist however I can for you. All right. Some things we need to look at, and we're looking at homes, is the soil types. There's basically four types of classifications of soils. There are gravel. You have sand. You have silt. You have clay. Most soils are a mixture of two or more of these soil types, and the mixture of it is called of the soil is called loam. Uh, soil classifications depend on the ingredients that has the most influence on the soil behavior. We have an area around me here in, in uh, South Texas we call black gumbo, and that's because there's a lot of clay in it. But as our ground gets wet, it begins to swell and as it gets dry, it shrinks. So we have a lot of foundation movement in, in this particular area of the country. Uh, soil classification depends on the ingredients that has the most influence on the soil's behavior. In other words, if you have more gravel involved with, with silt or clay with sand. Uh, of course, example, gravel and sand are, would be a coarse grain soil. Uh, all of these different soil types, expansive clay soils are problematic because as I said, they expand and contract when the water's, uh, rain waters recede or whenever it begins to shrink because of lack of rain. Uh, most common conditions that cause red flags, shifting and expanding soils. Uh, I can give you an example of that. I inspected a home for a realtor. His daughter was buying a home and, and he had asked me to look at it. It's out near Lake Houston here in the Houston area. And I go out, and on the very back corner, there was a little hairline crack. I mean, it looked like you took a pencil and drew a line about five feet from the back corner of the house. Uh, this property was vacant. It had no lawn irrigation system to it, which is something that we recommend in this particular part of the country to keep the soil moist because of the heaving and, and uh, shrinkage of soils going on. But the neighbors on both sides of this house did have sprinkler systems. Their yards was lush and green and beautiful during the summer, where the one I was inspecting was dry and the dirt was pulling away from the slab at the edge. You could put your hand between the house slab and the yard because it's so dry and the soil has shrank. Well, I commented to the realtor, I said, look, th there is a crack on the foundation. Uh, on the back of the house, I told him where it was, took a picture of it. I said, at this stage, it doesn't appear to be anything major, but it's something you need to be aware of and be careful and watch. And I explained about the water uh, that would help the soil to swell or lack of it makes it shrink. I said, but with both neighbors' yards being luscious and green and a nice irrigation system going on, yours not, I said, it puts you into a real bad position with your foundation on this type of soil. So 30 days later, they were going to closing and him and his daughter decided to go by and look at this house one more time before they went and signed on the line and said, this is my house. So they went by and he calls me. Uh, he's all alarmed. He says, Paul, he said, that little hairline crack you told me about said we need to watch it. He said, you won't believe what's happened. Well, this time happened to be in the middle of summer and one of these dry heat spells in the south that we had. He said, that little hairline crack, he said, I, now I can put my hand in it. Think about that. That's 30 days later. And it was this look like a pencil line drawn. So in that 30 days, this house has shifted and moved drastically. And I said, I have got to see that because all my years of inspecting, I haven't seen that rapid of movement in this area. So I, I go out of my way to go by there and look at this. And sure enough, I was shocked. I mean, the whole corner of that house had shifted and you can put your hand in that little crack. So sometimes when you're reporting on your report, issues that you see while you're walking around a house, 
those little ones may come up to be a big thing. So don't ignore them. Make a point about it. Let your client know, hey, this is a crack, a little crack. You know, it's you need to watch it. You know, keep them monitoring on the thing or just send them to a professional. Pass the buck, if you will, because sometimes you don't want that responsibility. But if I hadn't have told them about that crack, they went back then. I'm sure I would have gotten a call back. So you should have told me there was a crack in that slab. So, you know, just report what you see. Don't be afraid of it. Just report it. And you don't have to scare them to death with it. But you do need to at least put it in your written report that, that it's there. But the freezing and thawing soils, that does the same thing. It can cause uh, highways to pop, a buckle. So it can definitely move a uh, house foundation to, to buckle and, and break. Uh, leaking roofs, windows, and doors. Those are always things you want to look for. Those are red flags. Those are also indicators that it may not just be that, but it could be something more than just a leak. It could also turn into mold. It could turn into wood rot. It could turn into all kinds of things. Uh, sinkholes, settled in landfills, moving uh, landslides. If the property is built on a, a, a lot that has a slope to it, if there's not a retention wall to keep that slab in place, sometimes as that soil begins to move, the rocks begin to shift, guess what? The house is going to move too. So those are indicators you want to look for. So those are red flags. If you see those, your red flag ought to go up and say, yeah, there's an issue. I need to put a note in my report explain to the clients. Improper drainage. Drainage is a major important issue for foundations. Uh, it causes all kinds of, of, of defects to occur. But improper grading, if the house, the land around the house is not properly graded to drain away from the house, it could cause all kinds of problems. If you have a house that's built upon pier and beam and the grade is not sloped where water goes out from under the house, it doesn't allow it to get underneath the house and collect then you're going to have problems with the foundation. Uh, improper grading is a big deal. Improper installation uh, in all, of all types of stucco. I can tell you as an inspector, I've done this for, like I said, almost 30 years now, uh, stucco is a major concern. I personally have not found probably just a handful, if that, of homes with stucco, even commercial properties with stucco, where the stucco was properly installed. So stucco is always a red flag. Always look at the stucco. If you're not familiar with stucco, we offer some classes online. Get familiar with it. EDI is Exterior Design Institute is a organization that certifies people in stucco, all types of installations. And uh, we have some great classes on stucco. I encourage you, if you have homes in your area that have stucco, become familiar with it get in and get to know what stucco really is and different types of stucco and the things to look at. Uh, improper installed weather resistant barrier. That's what the WRB means. Weather resistant barrier materials, flashing details. This is huge. If you're doing inspections of, of pre drywall, we call them uh, inspections. This is where you'll get to see the weather resistant material installed you get to see a lot of the flashing details around the windows and doors and roof that, are, that may have been installed or may be lacking. Those are red flag issues. Those are things you want to look at because they will allow water intrusions to occur. But lack of just proper maintenance. You know, if a house is not maintained, things happen. I mean, it's it's you know, it's just obvious if you walk in, the house is not maintained. Just as bad as if I told you earlier in the presentation that if the house has fresh paint, new floor coverings, my red flags go up immediately to start looking even closer than what I normally would. But the lack of proper maintenance is the same way because they didn't maintain it. What can be wrong? So those are just things you want to look for in red flags as you do your inspection. All right, so who do you contact regarding red flags? Uh, it could be a structural engineer, could be a civil engineer. Could be a roofing professional, could be a foundation professional. Maybe it's a mechanical HVAC professional or electrician, electrical profession, or a plumber for a plumbing professional. 
It may even you may even need to contact the city, county, or the state government officials. Uh, these are being some definite code violation things that you might see that are hazard fire hazards or something that uh, you may have to contact them. Could even be the local gas company uh, if it property has a gas leak. You definitely want to notify somebody. Hey, there's a gas leak in the property. It needs attention now. So I mean, it depends on what you find out there. Who you who you would contact on it, but. I like to tell inspectors in particular as I teach courses that sometimes, you know, we don't like to refer out, uh, just recommend a structural engineer or a, you know, have a licensed plumber look further into this issue. Uh, but understand homeowners, they're naive. A lot of times it may be their first home they're buying. They may not know anything about electrical, plumbing, air conditioning. You're the expert. You're the one that they're counting on to tell us, look, if there's an issue, who do I need to get? You know, my realtor says, get a handyman. Well, a handyman may be a good choice, but you don't have to give them a name of anyone, but a professional is where you want to refer them to. So keep that in mind as you write your reports. There's nothing wrong with referring a professional. All right. Red flags, look for it. How about cracks in structures, driveways, sidewalks, patios? Even your basement floors are various foundation types. Uh, check all properties for cracks in their asphalt, concrete driveways, sidewalk, patio, decks, slabs, garage floors. Many times I pulled up in front of a property to do an inspection. And as I get out of my vehicle to look at the front of the house, take my first picture, uh, look at the sidewalks and the driveway. If the sidewalks are all cracked, buckled, uneven, well, number one, I'm going to write them up as being trip hazard and a hazard condition. But number two, it tells me there's a lot of tree roots or movement going on on this slab, on this found, on this property that could cause some foundation issues. So your red flags can start the minute you pull up in front of the house. A few hairline cracks are no cause for worry, but cracks that are wide enough to insert a number two pencil tip into can be an indicator of some type of defect. That's not a very wide crack, guys. Remember that what I told you earlier about the house I inspected was a little pencil line crack and how it moved in 30 days. So, you know, beware. You think, well, it's just a hairline crack. It's not a big deal. Well, it may actually be a big deal, especially if you don't note it on, on your report. Uh, if one side of a, of a crack in a walking surface is raised enough to trip, then it's definitely a safety hazard. It's an indication of uneven ground movement. So look for cracks between the patio edge and the house foundation. That can tell you if the if how dry the season may be and the soil may be shrinking. Uh, it let, lets you know that if it's dry like that, there could be some movement. So those are indicators to look for. But check to see if the sidewalks, driveways, patio decks, garage floors, or slabs have open voids. If there's anything that's open, uh, cracked, and damaged, even a detached garage that you think is just a piece of <laughs> useless garage that they're using for storage, if you're inspecting it, make your notes on it, write it up. Don't forget, those could be things that come back and, and bite you uh, on the rear end side later. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. There are several different types of cracks you'll encounter while inspecting a foundation. These are the hairline cracks, open cracks, cracks with vertebral slip slippage, and then the horizontal cracks. Now, keep in mind, not all cracks are structural, but they can be. So there's a big caveat there. They can be. But one of the most important things you want to see, if you're looking at a foundation on slab on grade and it has a horizontal crack, it could be like a sandwich effect. If you've got two slices of bread and you've got uh, movement, one, say the top piece of bread slid off the bottom piece just a little bit one way or the other, that's a horizontal crack. I personally don't know how they fix a crack like that. So if you find any type of movement like that on a foundation, recommend a structural engineer because that type of crack is a major structural issue. I mean, the slab has definitely failed. So keep that in mind as you look at them. Hairline cracks. Now, once we place concrete, a lot of people use the term, we pour the concrete. Well, 
actually we don't pour it, we place it. Uh, but during the normal curing process of concrete, random hairline cracks are going to appear. Hairline cracks are those that are randomly thin cracks that look like pencil lines drawn on the surface. They do not completely penetrate through the surface of the foundation. There are no openings between the edges, and they usually do not indicate serious problems. Those are what we call shrinkage cracks. All concrete is placed wet, and as it dries, you'll get some of those little uh, shrinkage cracks, as we call it. So, you know, just keep that in mind that uh, shrinkage cracks is what, what those are. Usually they're not a problem. Those come with time and experience, and uh, the more you do inspections, the more you'll become aware of it and familiar with what's going on there. Okay, open cracks. The width of open cracks should be estimated. Is it wider than the width of a lead in a number two pencil? If so, then that's definitely going to be a foundation crack. You need to note that because it can move, it can open up even further. But report all cracks that are wider than lead in a number two pencil or when the end of the crack is wider than the other. In other words, if you've got a crack that's opening up, that kind of you would take a consider a V shape. One end of it's pretty snug, the other end is opening up wider than the one on the other side. These are red flags. These are comments that should be written in your report with pictures. Always show pictures. This is what it is now. If you have a measuring tape, you can always put a measuring tape down, something to show that, hey, this is where the crack is today. You should monitor it. Have a professional further evaluate it. Okay, cracks of vertical slippage. Vertical slippage may be very serious. It means that the concrete on one side of the crack has moved down. So sometimes you'll get a ver vertical slippage like that. And I've actually seen houses where they crack from front to back. And one section of the house drops down several inches versus the other. So it makes a step inside the house, if you will. But when you see that, that is a major structural issue. Can they be corrected? Well, yes and no, but that's not our job as home inspectors to go and define that. I have been called out as an expert on a lot of these things because of my background and my experience and foundations. But, you know, as a typical home inspector, these are not your cup of tea, let's call it. This is beyond your scope. So if you see that, just recommend a professional move on. You don't have to spend time trying to figure out what caused it. Is it going to get worse? Because your client's going to ask you that. And you just say, maybe, maybe not. You need to contact a professional to tell you more about it. So sometimes we have to just kind of dodge the bullet because we don't want to answer those type of questions. We may know the answer, but sometimes it's best that we do not answer those questions. Okay, the horizontal cracks we talked about. Uh, cracking or foundations almost always accompanied by several vertical cracking. Horizontal cracking, cracking can be indicative of serious foundation issues. Should be referred to a licensed structural engineer. Anytime you see that, remember the sandwich effect, two slices of bread, that's horizontal cracking. Cold joints in concrete can appear to be horizontal cracks. Usually, uh, visually, un it's unsightly, but they're not normally considered serious structural defects. That's cold joints. Uh, cold joints occur during construction when all the concrete is not placed at the same time and the previous concrete solidifies prior to the placement of more concrete. If you get concrete, you can't just go in and put concrete on top of concrete. It doesn't fit very well. It doesn't adhere to it very well. They have to do some things with some rebar to make the different layers of concrete connect with each other. But be aware of those, and sometimes it can be an issue whenever you see it. So, again, report what you see. Remember, you don't have to tell people how to correct it. You just have to report what you see and, and recommend a profession. Uh, vertical di diagonal cracks are more serious. Uh, horizontal cracks can be serious. You should note their location, the width, and length. The cracks in foundation surfaces are common, like we said uh, there's some, the corners of some foundation have similar cracks on both sides of the corners. Uh, if a corner may be, it may be actually be, be missing a section of concrete altogether. In our area, we call those corner pops. And they're generally not a structural issue, but
but they can be. I mean, if you have a brick veneer wall or a stone veneer wall on top of those corners and you're missing a section of concrete at the very edge of the house, and this is what we're talking about, the very corner where the, the house foundation makes a curve, uh, it turns, those corners sometimes can break off. And typically that's because of the, where the house was put together to start with uh, during the original construction they didn't leave the plastic flashing underneath that corner of, that, of the house. And if you put bricks or stones or some type of mortar product on top of that, that concrete and the mortar on the stones or bricks is going to expand and contract at different uh, different segments of temperature. And, and some it'll cause it one or the other to start breaking. But if the corner broke off and it's a, it could be indicated a severe problem, so not just be merely a condition of random cracking. But sometimes if the corner popped off and it's, it's 12 inches on one side of the house, 12 inches on the other side, and you have bricks or stones on top, nothing's supporting those bricks or stones, so it's going to cause some issues. So be, be careful as you start seeing that. Sometimes it's common, sometimes it's not. So, yeah, I'll leave it up to you whether you report that as a foundation issue or you don't. I, I'm in Texas, and our standards of practice in the state of Texas for inspectors require if we find a crack in a foundation, even a corner crack that most of us would consider to be cosmetic, we have to report as foundation issues. Okay, we talked about the post-tension foundation. I showed you the picture earlier how the cables run through the foundation before the concrete's placed. This is what the end of it looks like. The cable sticks out about six feet through this opening at the time the concrete's placed. We give them about seven days for the concrete to cure. It takes 21 days, I know, for concrete to cure, but in post-tension foundation, we give them seven days. Then they come out and they put a hydraulic jack on this cable and pull that cable to uh, it's about 3,500 PSI. There's a lot of tension on it. And then a seat that was those wedges we talked about earlier. This is just the little pocket cover they put on it. These rusty things here, that's where you saw that uh, black piece inside. I told you it was a pocket. That's where they nailed it to the form boards that was around this foundation before the concrete was placed. This is a picture I showed you earlier where this little pocket area had uh, uh, popped loose because water had gotten into this cable. Of course, when rust develops on something metal, it expands. And as it expands, it pops this cover here off to where it looks like this. So if you're doing a house that has a post-tension foundation, and you'll know if it's post-tension because you'll see these pockets on at least two sides of the house. You won't see them on all four sides of the house because on the post-tension, you have this section, which is what we call the live end, the cable that they pull to tension it. The other, this cable is set to the inside of the form board, and we call that a dead end because it's attached there. So one cable in, they pull, and you'll see this on at least two sides of the house. But if you start seeing, like on this left picture, where the cable's rusty, that is a repair item. <clears throat> a lot of people say it's a maintenance. It is considered a maintenance. But at the same time, if that maintenance is neglected, these wedges slip and that cable that runs through the house from one side to the other can pop and it'll actually pop up to the inside of a house. So it can definitely cause some issues uh, it could cause death even. I mean, if somebody got hit with that cable and that type of pressure, it could rip them apart. So by all means, it's a, it's a defect in your report repair item. This is another one where it just wasn't seated very well. See, I start to crack. As, as thing gets rusty, you'll see things start to crack like that on the foundation. Again, that is a red flag to call for professional service on it. As I said, the cables come out, or here's one that actually broke in a house. If you look at the picture on the left, you see this cable sticking out. The pocket's all the way out here. The cables come out. They don't just pull loose like that. If you see that, there's going to be something that's happened, and chances are that cable's popped inside the house. And if you look at the right side picture, this is inside of a closet. That cable popped, come right out of that foundation. Now, this one didn't break loose, but can you imagine if uh, someone were standing in the middle of a kitchen, this thing broke in the kitchen? It could, it could definitely cause some injury. So 
definitely these, if, if you don't think you've got post tension slab in your area, I would tell you to investigate further because chances are you probably will have if you don't have now because they're pretty common, especially in areas that don't have basements where we have slab on grades. These are common. Uh, post tension cables, you say, well, I don't never, I never have seen them, don't know about them. You probably have, just don't realize it. If you have a highway that's divided where they have cables down the middle medium uh, with, you know, just cables, those are post tension cables. High rise parking garages, the cables that divide those different floors so the cars don't drive off the slopes of a parking uh, section onto another section. Those are post tension cables. Post tension cables everywhere. I mean, they're they're there. You may not recognize them, but uh, if you start looking at your hearing this uh, presentation, you may begin to start seeing. Hey, they are more than what I ever thought they were. So they're popular. This is a sample of, of a foundation area. It may not be common in your area, but it is in mine. And uh, these are the post tension foundations. Oops, let me back up. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hit that button. But this is a post tension slab. Uh, what we do, they, we do, they do these little uh, sections like this and they have grade beams coming in and out where the support walls will be. And they run these cables. You can see how they got them run down each side. They run across. And there are certain ways that these things have to be, certain things we look at. I mean, I do a lot of post-tension foundation pre-pour inspections uh, because I get paid good money for doing it. Uh, if you have these in your area, if you ever go buy a new construction, you see this type of slab, you'll know what it is, is post-tension foundation. So very, very popular foundation. To me, it's not what I would want on my own house. I didn't use post-tension foundation. I use the rebar and wire mesh, uh, which makes a stronger slab on grade, engineer type slab. Uh, but these, the boot common for production builders, they do these because they are less expensive than the other uh, foundations like I put on my own house. But it, you know, it's a preference. Uh, a lot of engineers say, all oh, these are great. Well, that's an engineer's opinion. They're entitled to theirs, as well as me, you and I are entitled to our opinion. Uh, do they work? Yeah, they work. They, they work. Uh, and they hold up well. Uh, just not the type of foundation I'd put on my own house. All right. Did you know you can become a certified foundation inspector? You want to expand your business? You want to get into uh, making a better dollar for your inspection fees? Yeah, yeah, it's possible. Here's the link I put in here. You can copy. Uh, this is where you can go in and become a uh, certified as a foundation inspector. By doing this, you can work for builders. You can work for the uh, person that's having a home built. Uh, you can... There's a lot of things to do with it. You make a lot more money by being certified in, in different categories. So I encourage you to get as many certifications as you can because the more certification you get, the more professional certification you get, the higher your fees can be because you become qualified and knowledgeable and people will respect that and, the, and they'll call you and they'll pay you better money for your inspection. So uh, be aware of that. But there's also post-tension foundation uh, they do uh, certification classes. But did you know you can also become certified international residential code concrete inspector? And you go to the website I've got down below here, learn iccsafe.org, uh, and they have a lot of things that you can get certified on, anything in residential, commercial, uh, energy codes. I mean, you name it, they've got them. Uh, you can even get certified as a permit person to in, uh, check for permits for like municipalities. But I'd encourage you, don't be afraid to get certified uh, by the International Code Council because those are great certifications. And as I said in one of the earlier presentations, uh, InterNACHI actually is offering a online course to study for your exam on uh, getting your building certification as a builder, building inspector. And that's only one of the five designations of a residential that you can get. But you have the building, you have electrical, you have mechanical, then you have the plumbing. And then once you get all four of those, they will automatically give you the level uh, R5, which is a combination residential inspector. So you'll learn it. I mean, these are open book tests that you take with them. 
Uh, again, I would tell you to get the commentary uh, code book that you'll be able to uh, read the code and then see the commentary. It kind of explains more in depth what the code, what they're saying in the code. It's a little easier to understand. And then set your test. It's an, uh, you can take it at different places online, and uh, but it is an open book test. But don't be fooled by me telling you it's an open book test and you think, oh, it's a piece of cake, I can do it. I, I don't know of anyone that I've ever talked to that has their code certifications that took those exams and said, oh, this is easy. <laughs> Everybody I've talked to says it's the hardest test they've ever taken. So not trying to scare you, but I just want to prepare you. It's not a piece of cake. You have to know how to find the codes in the books, and that's it, because sometimes one code will read uh, a certain way, and it may not be in the code section that you think it should be in, but it'd be in another one. One of the, some of those would be mechanical. Some will be the HVAC system. Some of them's a gas system. So there's a you know you have to know where to look at. And your index in the code books will help you find a lot of that. So anyway, uh, check out those websites. I left it on the screen here purposely for a while so you can take a picture. Uh, I don't know that you can click the link. It's underscored, so I don't know if it'll work on your end uh, of it to click and, and try it. But uh, anyway, if you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to me, and uh, I'll certainly try to help you best I can on uh, how to prepare for these things or how to get started. I do know that InterNACHI has uh, uh, flashcards on these topics, too, that can be beneficial to you. And I, I can tell you when I took my code search classes and tests, I took them years ago, uh, I used the flashcards. I used all type of any type of practice exam I could find, I'd take everything I could to pass it. So uh, it's it's a lot easier. When I took mine, it's been years ago and it's changed since that time because I've been in this business for over 30 years now. The code cert classes, you had to take all four exams at one time. That was an eight-hour day testing. Well, it was tough. Finally, they've changed it now where you can take one section at a time. You can take it just on building or just the electrical part or the plumbing or the mechanical part. And it's like a two-hour exam that's open book. So, you know, you can prepare a little easier to take it like that rather than eight-hour exam. So some of us old-timers have been out there for a few days, a few years. You'll have mercy on us once you take that test, I promise you. But anyway, good luck to you. If you decide to take that test, I wish you my best. Okay, thanks again for attending our, our webinar. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. And we'll uh, you'll go back and, uh, and attend all of our six-part webinars. So this is the end of part two, and uh, we hope to see you again on, on part three. So uh, thanks again for attending. Again, I'm Paul Roebuck.